ecology class last fall um, and also developed a project that's centered around crayfish behavior. Um, I guess ecology is how I recruit all of my research students. <laughs> um, so Andy, again, was very intrigued by this aspect of behavior and sensory ecology, um, and so she joined my lab um, and is planning to stick around for a master's degree after that. So this is based on the project that she ran over the last year. Okay, with that being said, aquatic, well, organisms assess their environment through information, right? Well, that information has a big concept called sensory landscape. Well, a sensory landscape uh, is a spatial and temporal distribution of all stimuli. Well, what's really interesting is when you start assessing aquatic organisms, right? Well, they assess their information through mostly chemical stimuli, right? Well, through that stimuli, there's this uh, concept called uh, non consumptive effects, these, or NCEs. These NCEs can be triggered by chemical stimuli, which ultimately impact the organism in a way that they, that they don't want to go towards wherever that chemical stimuli is, right? Well, that can be seen in this uh, Kinder and Albus 2017 paper through lionfish and then their um, prey. The more lionfish that are around, the less the prey is going to be in that certain area, no matter if that uh, organism is there or not. And it has the opposite effect when the lionfish aren't around. So I also did some more digging and found this paper for Jersek and Moore 2017, where they used crayfish and conspecifics. Conspecifics con are, are organisms that are of the same, are the same. So like crayfish and crayfish. It doesn't necessarily have to be the same species. With that, I came up with a hypothesis that basically deemed um, whether or not I could influence that one. Uh, organism to go into that particular area with an, an attractive stimuli. From there, I basically collected crayfish from around this area, which were the Cambrian crusade, this crayfish right here. From there, I put them in isolation for at least a week, that way that they had no influence from any chemical, mechanical, or visual stimuli. From there, I created an arena that looks like this, where I had two five gallon buckets and then two five liter buckets on top. From there I had two, two tubes that inserted on the five liter buckets that went into the arena. This is how my chemical odor stimuli was inputted into this arena. Um, I also had the visual part of the arena that looked the same, whereas I had one shelter on each side and depending on which uh, treatment I had, either a food source or none. From there, from, from there, I placed the crayfish out of isolation into the arena where <clears throat> they were in a cage for at least five minutes acclimation time to get used to the new water from being transferred from the isolation to the arena. Then, uh, depending on which um, experimental group or control I, I had in the uh, five liter the five liter of buckets. The control was just the water, whereas the uh, treatment one was either just predator and water, depending on which side, and then uh, treatment two was predator water plus the food source, with, and then the other side was just water. From there, I lit the cage up uh, after the 15 minute acclimation period and let the crayfish explore while whatever respective uh, treatment is being inputted into the arena. All the while, I also am recording, um, recording the uh, the trial. And then from there, I basically watched the videos. Uh, I came up with my own ethogram that is very different from the one y'all saw previously. Um, basically, I have initial arm choice, total time spent in the neutral zone, time handling shelters, and air storms. From there, we ran the data, put it in Excel, and then um, also used um, a statistical analysis. Um, in R, where I ran a chi-squared uh, chi test, and it, uh, the results showed that it was not significant, but yet we do see trends. These trends from the control, you see that they relied heavily in the neutral area, which was basically right here in the middle where there was no chemical stimuli being inputted. In treatment one, you see that there was a big, a big push towards the water side, which means there was no stimuli run on that side. Whereas in treatment two, you see they're more, they're more towards the neutral zone, which meant that maybe, possibly, 
that the uh, that the uh, food source was maybe maybe influencing them to come towards that um, decide where the predator odor was. From there, just out of curiosity, we ran well. We ran a manova and showed that there was no significance. But from there, out of curiosity, we also uh, ran a couple additional anovas, and the one that really stuck out was um, time spent in the neutral zone. As you can see, there's like little stepping there's little stepping stones. Whereas from the control, you see like they're all making them com uh, compact, and and then um, in the new, in the uh, treatment one, you see that there's more of a step more towards the neutral zone, and then more uh, in treatment two. Um, we think mainly um, these influences. I mean, we didn't really find any evidence that suggests um, that the aversive or attractive stimuli had any effect on the crayfish decision making, but we also saw those trends. Hopefully with um, more research um, and more uh, trials that are put into this, I can actually see, uh, actually get evidence from it. So this, this, this is not done. <laughs> but this is just a push in the right direction. Okay, do we have questions?